Today, my host is a whole lot of, lot of things. Um, he has been working for over 15 years in human resources, cutting across oil and gas manufacturing, and um, he has his experience in setting up a new organization and business startups in Africa countries. I am thrilled today to introduce you to Mr. Victor Adebayo, MBA, CBHR, SHRM, SCP, CMC, <laughs> FIMC, MCIPM. Thank you so much for this privilege. <laughs> yes. Um, Thank you so much for having me. <laughs> Thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, so he has worked as resource officer, that's in 2006, and then he has been an executive assistant at Zenith Bank PLC. He's been an associate manager, human resources at Crota and Gamble. He's worked as recruiting and talent manager of Sahara Africa with General Electric. He has worked as vice president and head human resources, FBN Capital. He has worked as MD principal consultant, Megabox Solutions. He has worked as um, an independent director and Group HR Director Africa, Recharing Summit Group Africa, Director Human Resources Administration SHE at Airtel Nigeria. Currently is working as Chief Operations Officer, CIG Group Africa Business Center. And I want to ask, how do you cope? Like, how do you manage this? Like, currently you kind of, you're taking two roles. Can you let us know a little about that? Sir? Well, thank you very much for having and hosting me first. I think it's a privilege being here and being able to be able to share with God's children. Um, and also being able to tell them that, look, um, it's a choice for us. And I think God has created a privilege for us to choose to get to heaven either as a Daniel or as an Abraham or as a Lazarus. I mean, the multiple options are there for us and i'm very choosy about those options um, daniel was quite influential in government um, abraham we know him with wealth and of course lazarus also served god but he had nothing um, so it's not a function of you know if you serve god automatically this is going to be it but what we are assured is that god is going to be with us here on earth and we'll make it to heaven but the in between there's a whole lot of role that we have to play in that. Um, back to your specific question. Um, yes, I'm currently Chief Operations Officer for the CIG Group. Um, I also sit on the board of um, Diversity Talent Management Limited as the chairman of the board. And, and that's not the only company I sit on the board. Um, I recently left the board of uh, Seamless HR it's a it's africa's foremost you know um hr management software company um i've had the opportunity of sitting on the board for a couple of years and yes um yeah a couple of other organizations too about three wow. or four of them it's 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 a bit it's challenging Mm -hmm. But one thing I have learned to do is to look at what is in front of me at the current time and deal with it. Um, as much as possible, a lot has to do with organization and planning. And, and that's why I love to have my schedules out there. But of course, you also make provisions for interruptions. I mean, you know, family, um, church, um, several other things come in but i always love to plan in advance and i can then say okay at this particular point in time this is what i'm going to be responsible for um at um what's it called cig group of course it's an everyday day-to-day -day work that i do there um for the rest of the other businesses there are things that i attend to occasionally not on a daily basis so I get to work within my schedule to be able to deal with all of those. And that's how I've been able to manage it. Oh, that's great. Thank you so much for sharing that part with us that you have to organize um, as part of it. And um, 
I also recognize that I'm sure you must have your wife must be really supportive, like for you to be doing a whole lot of these things. Because I know I've been <laughs> when I interview, like, yeah, true. <laughs> interview people and then I'll be like okay because if, you, if the whole front is not set <laughs> it's, um, I, it's, a, it, it's a it's a difficult question for me to answer I, and honestly I, I I was thinking about that question yesterday two days ago this morning and I it was a question I threw to my wife to say you know what's gonna be on record you did for me and, and it's a bit peculiar and I, and I will use it, you know, in two ways here. Um, my wife is running her medical residency, so it's a bit tough for her. She literally lives within the hospital walls and, you know, comes home maybe during the weekends and, you know, spend a little time and then she goes back. And for me, in the course of my career, I've had to move from my house to go and live with her in the hospital at some point. Uh, <laughs> yes, my my kids moved to my parents' house. My parents live about 20 minutes away from us. So my wife's cousin also lives with us. So my, my wife's cousin, my kids, they all moved to my parents' place. The school bus picks them up from there, drops them there. And then they also come home during the weekends. And so the family time is only during the weekends. And because of the multiple, you know, business pressures here and there for me, sometimes when I get to discussing with my wife, she goes, oh, you should have done this, you should have done that. And I give her that look, okay, I should have done everything. <laughs> what support are you going to give me on getting them all done? Well, it's I guess you're both you. supporting each other then. <laughs> the support is both ways, right? You need it, you need it too. Yeah, and that, I, I totally understand. Like, literally, there's an exam I was planning to write early this year and okay. because so i wanted to do it quickly and get it all done out of the way but something happened my husband wanted to make a transition to and then he needed that quality time so i had to hang my own it was painful for me but i had to hang <laughs> it <laughs> so and, and, and let me comment on let, let me just give a, a general comment on that and yeah. a bit around some of my own personal perspectives and, and pardon me this is also me talking based on my experience I know. See, it's there is a need for a balancing act in all of these and we are christian families we are christian homes um for as long as god has gifted us with spouses who are focused who love the Lord, who, you know, um, take the pain to plant for the family. And they would also give us the support in our own area. Because I, I tell my wife every time, look, I'm going to support your career to whatever extent, provided family is not sacrificed. Mm -hmm. You know, because whether we like it or not, we can't use the standards of the world to be able to judge or drive our home ease. We can't use the old independent lifestyle that exists in the world to be able to drive our homes. There is still that place of submission, but at the end of the day, the man also owes it as a responsibility to say, I need to give this support to my spouse too, to be able to develop. Because, I mean, I tell her, yeah, I'm, I'm getting to the peak of corporate ladder. Um, done quite a number of things in that space yes people introduce my wife as doctor although she tells me sometimes to go for a phd so when they are introducing us instead of mr and dr mrs it is doctor and dr mrs and i said well if the phd is in money making maybe i'll do it but, <laughs> <laughs> but for now just spare me <laughs> i can't add the rigor of a phd to my already very busy and complicated <laughs> life yeah. you know but you know, it's 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 important that sometimes we, our wives, make some of those painful sacrifices, and trust us, trust our leadership, as we also submit to Christ, that you know we will also reciprocate, and we will, you know, give you whatever the support may be at the appropriate time to be able to also grow, and we have your back, whatever the situation may be. Yeah. And, and and that's just the thing so 
just just trust us on that yeah and we will. i do i do and he already is actually giving me that time because he's done with his face now and then he's like it's your turn so what do you want to do tell me what you want me to do and all of that that's that's the beauty of a christian family (laughs) that's the beauty of it that's the beauty of it there's no competition we we will all get there and we will get to heaven together that's the most important thing amen yeah that's good thank you so much for sharing i really appreciate your vulnerability sharing your own yeah how are you able to achieve this are they still in this flesh like flesh and blood like me <laughs> no it's the truth it's the truth and then i like i i really appreciate it when you're vulnerable to tell them see i feel the same pain it's painful for me to make some decisions too but this is the way we do it this is the way we do it yeah. that is really huge because people then see that yes do i have my weaknesses i have things that you know for me for instance now this is like a big dream for me and that's why i said i was i, I became <laughs> you know nervous this morning like it's really happening i went for it <laughs> i don't know you personally but i don't know that it, it god was just dropped in my spirit like a couple of months ago that why not do this and not only you there are two other persons that came to my mind and i reached out to them like just like that and they have all responded to me you know and all of those things and i don't it feels like wow so this is achievable so when we know that even within our weaknesses we can pursue our goals our dreams and then we can still because the truth is we have dreams and um we want to make it we want people to really see that truly you can achieve your dream even as a believer as a christian it doesn't end with okay i am a child of god i'm expecting heaven and then we are not we are not useful while we are here on earth. So thank you so yeah. much now for no sharing all of this. No and I want to ask, so my husband mentioned to me that you are an entrepreneur. Is that true? Like also that you have yes. your own businesses. Okay. So that piece, like, can you just tell us <laughs> what you do? <laughs> and how okay. does it in your day day to day? I think um, the entrepreneurship journey is something I'd always had in mind, even as an undergraduate student. I The first thing was, I, I looked at our parents, and, and this is one of my vulnerabilities too. They worked all their lives in establishments, and at a point in time, they needed to go. So what was life immediately after they exited those places? What was the quality of life, you know, the moment they left those places? There was definitely a dip. And so I thought to myself, you know, how do we prevent this? I mean, we live in Africa where there's no social security technically, and everybody has to, you know, do everything for himself, basically. So I I started thinking of that. And one of the first things, I'm very passionate about education. And so that came up in my mind. And I told my wife that, look, this is one of the things I want to do. Even when we were cutting, I'd always shared that dream with her. So at a point in time, um, I had a one of the artisans who worked with me when we were building our house uh, told me about a property that was up for sale. So I said, okay, let's go see it. We went, we checked it out. I saw it was a nice, you know, it was one of those old buildings, but that time you will know it's the house of a wealthy man. I mean, you know, the architecture, everything was classic for the time when it was built. I think the man said he built that place maybe 1990 or 1991 or so, thereabouts. So I'm like, wow. And I thought to my wife, okay, we live on the mainland, we work on the island, and very many of us leave our homes very early in the morning, 5 a.m., 5.30, 6 a.m., to be able to make it on time to the office. And I could imagine how many families struggled with where to put their children when they are setting out that early, because obviously the schools were open at that time. So I thought, how about setting up a crutch that worked 24 hours? And then the teachers or the caregivers there will be nurses whom we would give Montessori education training so that when parents come there, they can drop their kids. They know they are dropping their children with healthcare professionals who also have education certification and so they could take care of them. So basically, let's start with a crutch, but a crutch with a difference. And then we thought about, okay, we take the vitals of the children every day and at the end of the week, we will submit the vitals details to the parents. 
So it was just one of those wow effects that we wanted to create. And so even if they were running late, they knew their children were in safe hands. In safe hands. And for the older kids, you could ask the school bus to drop them with us so we could render after school services for those ones. And it was also at a point in time when there was this made from hell being trending in Nigeria where housemates were abusing children of you know their principals and all of that so we're like you can even ship the mates to us and you know of course they will be under our watch so they can't do anything hellish there and and that was the plan so we pimped up the place um everything was looking beautiful and we opened up the place for parents to come see with their kids and when they came around, they all started saying, OK, so we've seen the crutch. Where is the nursery class? Where are the primary classes? And we're like, uh, excuse me, it's just a crutch. No nursery, no primary. And they were like, no, 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 no. I can't drop one child here and then go drop the other somewhere else. You need to give me a nursery. You need to give me a primary. And I told them, I looked at my wife and said, this is not what we plan to do. <laughs> <I> <laughs> And she was like, listen to the voice of the customer. You always exactly. teach it. Mm-hmm. So I'm like, okay, maybe we should convert some of the classrooms to, you know, nursery and primary. And then during one major long break, we could mm-hmm. then raise the building and all of that. And she was like, yeah, right. That's how easy it is to raise a building. <laughs> so we are not, we are not going to open up. You know, she's, she's got some of those cliches that, you know, gets to me sometimes. And I give her that look. <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> So I, I, I eventually we did not open at that point in time. So we had to then get in the engineers again and came up with a completely different drawing and pulled down the building and we constructed something else, a uh, two-story building. And that was how the full-fledged school was born. So it was from, you know, the request of the parents. And I mean, it's been five years now, and we're doing well. Great, um, great. Wow. We we're thinking of several other entrepreneurial adventures we want to get into. Like diversity talent was also an entrepreneurial adventure for me at the beginning um, because I felt like I had these skills. There was this medium and small scale enterprises uh, springing up across Nigeria, mm-hmm. and many of them could not afford the big four consulting to come and help them with strategy and organization design. And I wanted to carve that niche for myself. And that was how I I saw the opportunity and I immediately, you know, went into it. And gradually I hired staff members to work for me, serving various businesses. And so it was easy for me to be able to step back and do things from the board while the rest of the team simply ran the organization and the same thing for the school so it's got its own head and the teachers and both the teaching and non-teaching staff and so they only reach out to me when it comes to board decisions and sometimes financial decisions um, because they have some limits within which they can spend anything above that limit needs to come up to the board and I had to set up a couple of other people too. Um, my lawyer was involved. I brought him in on the board and a couple of other you know, friends of like-minded passion. And we just wanted to create qualitative education that prepared children for the future world of work and not just looking at what is existent today. Like we know the world is changing so fast. Um, the kind of job openings that will be available then in the future aren't even available now. So we just needed to get them thinking, expand their horizon. And interestingly, all the schools in the area now are now copying us, everything we do. <laughs> yeah, because honestly, that idea looks novel. Like you, you want to run a 24 hour crutch. And then yeah. they, they took it a step further and like, okay, you give me so that I can even, yeah, that's really, really great. I, I can <laughs> imagine. And then you mentioned that when you want to take some, like maybe financial decisions or, you know, that affects, I, I just want to know because for me i'm learning from you honestly i don't know one can start a business that has been something i look at and i'm like i'm reluctant to start something when it comes to business of course i have little business on the side and all of those things but trying to go big 
I'll be like, do you really need to be an intrinsic part of that? Like, but you're making it so seamless. Like, okay, something you can, you set people up. So how do you trust them? You know, that has been the thing. Like, how do you trust them? Because some people believe if I'm not there, they will not do it so well. It's tough, I must confess. And the, the, the bane of businesses in Nigeria and on the African continent is integrity. See, we, we don't need handouts from different parts of the world. It's simply when you start a business, getting people of character in that business can be very tough. And that's one opportunity that we Christian professionals can actually plug in. Mm -hmm. It's rather unfortunate these days that, you know, um, at a point in time when the church was growing, various organizations will write to the church to say, we just need your members because they are honest, they are faithful, they are transparent, they are accountable. But of course, as the people saw that a lot of those opportunities were coming in, then came the mixed multitude. And because the church is an open place, even the mixed multitude, we want them saved. But some of them have only got their eyes on those opportunities and they are not looking at the message of Jesus that we also have to give to the world so that they can also be saved. So coincidentally, some of these people got those opportunities and then gradually we started hearing things like, oh, your members are not as faithful as they used to be. It's simply because of the infusion of those mixed multitudes who actually took advantage of our liberty in Christ. But then, that as it may be, it is also pertinent for us to understand the various schools or various areas of management. And that simply means you create standard operating procedures, SLEs, approval matrix, and there's someone who is the initiator, different from someone who is the approval, uh, approver. And you have approved vendors who can carry out transactions within your organization. So it's, it makes it a bit more challenging for anybody to go and connive. I'm not saying it doesn't exist, but it makes it more difficult for them to all connive because to perpetrate any act of financial impropriety, it's going to require two, three, four, five people conniving. And the more people there are in a deal, the greater the chances of it leaking at some point in time whether immediately or sometime down the line you would notice some of those things and i'll give you a classic example i, I used to have some young chap who worked with me on the admin end in the school and so when it came to fueling the school buses he would go there lead the buses tell the fuel attendants to put in fuel and then once the buses are filled up he asks them to leave and then he pays the guy there how much he pays, the drivers are not aware. But I keep getting, you know, huge bills that I feel, really, are we consuming that much petrol, you know, every week? I mean, for each week, I spend almost 40000 And I felt like, I mean, it's within the estate here. Where are we going? So, and then I brought in the headmistress and put her in charge. And, you know, told the driver, when you buy, before you drive off, how many liters of fuel did they sell into your car? What was the price reading on the dashboard? So don't just tell me, I was just seated in the car and he was outside and he just told me, you are light. Because you will give me your own independent report. This chap would also give me his own independent report. And the HM would also give me our own report at the end of the day. I mean, that number crashed by, it dropped to about 10,000 weekly. Wow. So, <laughs> um, so you put processes and some of these things in place and, and you've got to be courageous, especially in a part of the world where, you know, the judiciary is not as effective, the policing system is not as effective as you want it to be. So you've got to be brave hearted to be able to do that. But the best way to go is putting systems and processes, give room for some flexibility okay. at some point in time, but at the same time too, conduct your spot checks, mm -hmm. sending people who will go in there as, you know, um, we call them mystery shoppers. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. who will just go and act like they want to make inquiries and the rest of those things so that you can have updates about what is happening i did a lot of that and you know i had to fire some teachers at some point mm-hmm. in time so, so new people <laughs> understand how to do things so don't be scared of setting out in business be very clear about what you want to do the market you want to serve and then how do you monetize those ideas it's not just for us to be passionate about something there's no essence of your passion or translating into financial goals i mean it will lead into frustration so how do i monetize that passion put all of that together you know and then start up you learn from mm. you know some of the mistakes mistakes and exactly like they say uh, everything we've always desired is on the other side of fear so face your fear and mm. you get it yeah thank you so much for sharing those are really great tips and yes i'll be setting out <laughs> yeah, thank you sir <laughs> so i wanted to also ask like with all of these things that you have to do your f- family work-life balance i know you talked a little about that but like are there principles that you adopt when it comes to like okay maybe this is the boundary for me work doesn't get into these you know when it comes to i i I want to have some time with my family because i know you have three gorgeous girls at least from what i can see those are my beautiful angels (laughs) yes they are they are really gorgeous what are the principles that guide your work-life balance you see as you rise in the career ladder yeah it's only in geography that the higher you go the cooler it becomes (laughs) in every other aspect of life the higher you go, the hotter it becomes. <laughs> I, can I mean, when when we got married initially, the agreement with my wife was I'm, I was never going to bring work home. So when I'm home, I'm home. And so when I got into the investment bank, I was coming home really late. Mm. And she was like, honey, what's going on? Blah, blah, blah. I'm like, you know, there's so much to do here. And you said I can't bring work home. So she was like, really? But can you do the work at home? I said, yes, I can do it at home, but you don't want me to bring work home. (laughs) (laughs) So she was like, okay, okay, you can bring it home. At least let's even be seeing your face. (laughs) So I I come home with my laptop, you know, my daughter is on my lap and, you know, I'm on my laptop. She's also trying to play with my keyboard and all of that. And of course we get talking, she's asking me questions and oh my goodness um when she asks you how was work today the answer she's expecting is not fine she wants to know when you got to the office what time you got there who was the first person you met what <laughs> meetings you attended what you guys discussed the, the, meetings, the outcomes <laughs> oh my world our wives are beautiful <laughs> so i have to share all of those and then in the midst of all of those share what are our collective plans also ask her how her day had been you know what she had done what support she needed i mean pardon me my house i have almost all the electrical gadgets to do almost everything because i I feel she needed all that help so as much automation as we could do we just wanted to have it done to be able to ensure that we spend more time together and let the automation do all of those work. So if you think you are making your wife hard working by hard doing the hand scrubbing and all of that, you are mistaken and you are missing out in the fun. So let the machines do everything that the machines can do. And then you guys spend the time, you know, doing the talking. And, you know, sometimes when you have to do things that machines can't do for you, I mean, you can also still bond. But, you know, when she had to move into the hospital, part of what I had to do was also, you know, rather than coming home every day to an empty nest, because my kids were with my parents, she was in the hospital. I chose to also move in there. It was a bit of a sacrifice. I mean, it's an ego thing for an African man to leave his house and go and be living in one small room, you know, know, in an hospital. I mean, it was not something <laughs> I really wanted. But, well, we had to do what we had to do and so it, it's been like that it's been like that so and at every point in time she she was upset sometimes she said oh i don't take the family out so two sundays ago i we closed from church and the moment we left church i just drove out 
And my babies were like, where are we going? I, I didn't say anything. And then they asked their mom, where are we going? She said, ask your dad. And then they asked me, dad, where are we going? I said, ask your mom. And then the kids busted into laughter. That What's going on here? <laughs> so until I drove into a Chinese restaurant and they all screamed, hey, Chinese, Chinese, Chinese. <laughs> and, you know, so I just intend to do more of such things. Just, you know, some events and all of that. It, it can be really busy. And at a point in time, actually, I think sometime early this month or late last month, I was even thinking of quitting my job. Hmm. Yes. Wow. Um, and for two reasons, um, focus on the family. My daughter is going to be going to secondary school now. And, you know, wow. it's six years there. After six years, you know, they're out of the house. Hmm. So what I owe them is first, knowledge and faith in God, building character and discipline into them and you know let them go into the world out there i'm not building inheritance for them they will build their own inheritance they can only leverage on what i have to multiply their own inheritance because my inheritance is my inheritance that's beautiful <laughs> like that's beautiful like i think more african parents need to really be like this like it's not like okay because it was I, it was tough for me growing up sometimes you want to go overboard and like my parents, my children shouldn't suffer. Even here in the um, United States, most of the things flying around now is how we can build wealth for our kids, like entrepreneurship, things you can, businesses you can do. And it, to me, it's not balanced. Where is the balance? Where, how are they going to be independent and, you know, go out all, all out by themselves and all for themselves. So I really appreciate you mentioning that. And I wanted to, since you talked about the kids, how is child training as a busy corporate man that you are can we learn from you take a few tips hmm. i i don't think the you know i i once had a mentee who told me she wished babies came with a user manual <laughs> <laughs> <No>. <laughs> because every child is different right. and the way they respond to different things also differs my second child is very bold and audacious she's going to challenge me on things mm -hmm. the last baby knows she's very close to my heart and so the elder ones will send her to me to try to manipulate me to doing things <laughs> that i don't want them to do but a couple of things that i allow them understand first the bible directs everything we do and so if they want to do anything i ask them the question will jesus do this mm. you know wow. at, at some point in time when we come back from church and i ask them what did you learn in church and you know little children they want to wiggle their way out so they look at each other's faces and then the next thing they say is we learned the word of god really <laughs> is it not the word of god they learned each other wow so like, that's okay, hard then. <laughs> which one did you learn today wow interesting finish we try and let them know do's and don'ts from mm. the point of view of the bible mm. and then we also try to let them understand some of our cultural nuances you don't talk to elderly people this way when your mom calls you don't just say yes say yes mommy or yes daddy and of course when they are at granny's place there's a cultural way we say sa or ma you know when they call you i inculcate all of that there is no superior or inferior <laughs> culture anywhere your culture is your identity and for as long as it does not come at conflict to the bible mm -hmm. i would incorporate it into my children's upbringing because that's their unique identity so i try to do that the other thing i try to do is not to rescue them if their mom is disciplining them. I would rather appeal to her to say, please now, please now, my children have begged you. I wouldn't give them a contrary instruction of, you know, and vice versa for her too. So we have that kind of agreement. And, um, and we have our own misunderstanding. We have our own disagreement as much as possible. Never let it be obvious to them and don't let the children, you know, get to know about you know some of those nuances and we also try to incorporate our local language which is a bit of a challenge now you wouldn't believe me and um, because my first daughter could speak very well 
Mm-hmm. But when they moved to grandpa's place, grandpa felt like, oh, the easiest way to communicate with them is just speak English. And so they understand the language, but they can't speak the language. So you talk to them in Yoruba language, for instance, they'll respond in English. So sometimes I tell them that if you ever need anything from daddy today, you need to speak Yoruba language. <laughs> Otherwise, you're getting nothing. Wow. So they then go and meet their aunt. How do you say, Daddy, I want this? And then that one tells them, and then they come and meet me. Daddy, we fair this. <laughs> That's interesting. Yeah. <laughs> so bits and pieces of all of those things. And then when we have the opportunity of family altar together, it's also another learning point. And family altar is always interrupted by them because they want to tell you the story of what happened. Oh, Shemil already did this in school, you know, something, whether related or not to the topic. So we just have to gift them with the patience to listen to whatever they had to say and then make a comment on it. Because those are some of the small, it's not like sit them down and then you start mm-hmm. indoctrinating them. Mm-hmm. You use every opportunity when they are talking to be able to share, to be able to correct and to be able to guide them. My kids know, oh, daddy does, if you ask them now, they'll tell you, daddy does four jobs. You know, they'll tell you, point blank. So if you ask them, what does your daddy do? They'll say, well, my daddy has four jobs. He does this, he does that, he does this. Mm-hmm. So they tell you, it's hard work. My daddy works really hard. So they the of hard yeah, work. And I tell them them. all of these things. So, so these are some of the basic building blocks. And as they grow older, you know, we, we, we expose them to more. When they asked my daughter what she wanted to be growing up, they weren't going to see secondary school. She said, anything my daddy was, after all, he's rich. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> really? <laughs> wow. So, the head teacher now told her, do you know your dad read zoology in school? I was like, oh, what's that? I'm coming to that, actually. <laughs> he had to then call me to confirm. And I said, don't you know that? She said, really? How come you're not doing this? I said, oh, mm-hmm. it's a long story and I'm going to tell you when you come home. And she said, you better do. So it's, those are learning opportunities for us. We just try as much as possible to create those scenarios or take advantage of scenarios that they create. And, and honestly, there are times when we are just tired and they come and you just like, go to your room. Please go to your room. I want to sleep. But I started feeling guilty of that. And that's why I've been thinking of either taking a career break Hmm. or doing something that was going to be a bit of some work from home opportunities, maybe something a little lighter, just to be able to ensure that, look, I need to gift them with more time now, at least to mold with my wife. It's been four and a half years that she's been in the hospital and all of that. Obviously, there are a lot of gaps now. And then for the children, I mean, let's rediscover each other and, you know, we can build a family because family is all you have left when everything else is gone. So you can't neglect it. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing all those wonderful tips. Yes, yes, that's be- and I can relate with some of them. Like you already, you're tired and then you still have to be there for them. That is really good. Thank you so much. Like you rightly said, those kids, every kid is different, really. Every child is different. That's something I didn't even read this from anywhere, except that the one the closest that I've heard about it is every pregnancy is different when we're pregnant. But just like that, so every child is different. My first is different from my second, is different from my third. And coincidentally, my second born is very audacious. So she's bold. In short, at some point, we had to devise like I prayed, we had to pray that God give me the how do I relate with this girl <laughs> and then we asked god helped me and then we started negotiating when she says this is what i want to do we'll be like okay can you do that later what about what about doing it this now and doing that later and all of that because in school she was bossing them around even the teacher she would tell them this is what i want to do when they ask her to do this and you know how they accommodate all of those things like they would tell them yeah they don't want to force them i'm like you need to teach her and you i don't know she can't be the one teaching you so the grace and i saw that she really changed so as much as she's scared of the cane i found that that 
when I started doing that um, negotiating with her, it really worked. It really worked. She would mm-hmm. just let go and like, okay, mommy, yeah, we can do this and all of those things. So every child is different. And I also want, want to ask you, because with all of these things, like, um, do you have weaknesses? I know is a is a question that looks about like <laughs> What are I know this is not a job interview, right? But yeah, <laughs> what are the things that you feel like yes? Because obviously we can see your strength. That is what we see more and all of that. You have mm. given me a bit of that, but are there specific <sighs> things that you think God can help me better here? So it's just uh, one, one clear weakness I have is um I have a tendency to overthink. Hmm. Uh, so for every situation and not excusing myself i had a humble background we weren't poor poor we were just okay but of course i also had to do stuff to be able to augment my life growing up as a child and and i'm very proud of that heritage it's helped me it's built in me the discipline and the rigor but you know engaging my father back then to say because i hear them every now and then talking about oh the president of the country did this he did that and the only reason why they were not able to they are not as wealthy or financially stable as they would have wanted to be everybody blamed government Hmm. so i told myself so how can i get into government and they said well you need good education and you need a rich network so i promised myself i was going to do that so as i grew older it became obvious to me it's not just government that you need to get into it's about how do you become self-sufficient that you are not having to rely on anybody like i do not have power in my house now i'm relying on my solar inverter to power my house so all day today i've not had electricity from the national grid and that's how i've been running my house in the last six years you know i just live on the solar panels and they power virtually everything apart from my water heaters in the house 24 7 you know there's electricity so because i always think of things from the point of cost and consequence so when i see anything i think far into the future what the consequences could be what it could mean and all of that and sometimes it drives me to overreacting in some situations and i'm i'm learning in a very hard way to be able to you know step back sometimes you know calm down sometimes you know let let life run sometimes everything will be clear over time so i overthink it drives me sometimes into overreacting um what other weakness i, I think one i also have is and uh, pardon me for saying this i'm a very intelligent person and i can be impatient with slow learners sometimes mm. <laughs> um it's something i'm you know trusting god to be able to help me and, and i i wish i could read something from one of my direct reports who resigned from the organization and she just sent me this yesterday night by the way today was her last day okay. um okay to me and she was like dear sir i have thought of the right words to type the right things to say to tender my sincere and heartfelt appreciation to you for your help in the last six months in cig when i say god brought you to cig specifically because of me i am not missing words or trying to make you feel some type of way it is my truth it is my reality tomorrow that is today i am signing out of the company honorably happy and not sad i am not leaving frustrated as i would have six months ago i am not leaving on a bitter note or experience I'm not living frowning or crying. I'm living happy and of course fulfilled. It ended well for me. Wow. I have God and you to thank for that. You came, you took me and taught me. You gave me peace and hope again. I found reason to get to work every day. I'll forever mention your name in my success story. You may think it is nothing, but it is a big deal for me. Thank you, sir, for the time you stood up and you spoke out for me. You spoke for me, defended me, shielded me, covered my mistakes and taught me i'm grateful for the gift of you in my life i owe it to god and you god bless you richly sir you know she sent this at about 8 46 p.m yesterday wow. 
Yeah, I'm, I'm like, I think I'm getting better. <laughs> that's really cute. I mean, it, that doesn't. I'm trying to see the elements of what you just said. <laughs> I couldn't find, couldn't find it. Yeah, that's great. Really sweet. Like your daughter asked you, zoology and human resources. What you're doing now? Like, <laughs> what happened? What, what was the? How did you move from zoology to human resources? The transition. I think the first question is, how did I get into zoology? Okay. <laughs> you know, in, in Nigeria, um, we all write the university matriculations examination to go into whichever university you would go into in Nigeria. And whatever you score goes into some cutoff ranges for the various institutions you've chosen. And that determines whether you can file to enter for that particular course of study or field of study. And for me, I didn't meet the benchmark score for what I wanted to do, which was electronics, electrical engineering. Wow. Interesting. <laughs> and so I was given the option zoology and I'm like, really? And the only thing zoology that came to my mind was, you know, some of those Discovery World Channel, National Geography. That's so I'm going to spend the rest of my life in the wildlife, you know, chasing after some <laughs> animals and trying to study them. How is that going to put food on my table in a country <laughs> like Nigeria? <laughs> so I was really depressed and worried, you know, fresh from secondary school. And then you're going into university and this is all you're going for. But my cousin, who is not even of the Christian faith, told me, look, if you don't get what you like, you end up liking what you get. Why not put your heart at this? My first semester, I was on the third class. But by the time I graduated, I had a very good two on second class upper division, and I was in the top 10 graduating from my department. No regrets in life, which is one of the things I've learned now in life. I'm not so particular about, oh, my daughter came first or second or third anymore. In real life, it is not so much as to who came first that becomes the most successful. But yes, it's also still important we spur them to do great things. So that aside, but I think it was this PWC guy who came in and was talking to Ross about building a career. Uh, and I think that was in our final year. And he talked about conducting a 360 degree feedback on yourself, where people will give you feedback on what your core areas of strengths are and the opportunity areas. Uh, for me, number one, I was a talkative. Um, number two, I make friends easily. Um, number three, I'm a very good teacher. When I grasp a concept, I I, would, I know how to break it down into very granular details for anybody to comprehend. Um, number four, I get along well even with very difficult people. So I began asking myself, where do they need people who have all these you know, behavioral or personality traits? And I knew about HR, public relations at the time, and then sales. And I read a lot more about the lifestyle of some of these people. A salesman can wake up in Lagos, you know, by afternoon, he tells you he's just arriving in Calabar. Evening is in Kano. I settled for human resources. And so when I started applying for jobs, I was very specific that I wanted HR. Then I was inspired like by people like Dulu Akiyemi, for instance, who, you know, his story then at that point in time was, you know, revolutionary. So I said, I can do this too. And that was how I got into human resources. But of course, over time, I've done more than human resources now. So even the sales that I did dread then, I've had to do sales now. So <laughs> it's life. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing. So um, uh, you are, how did you grow up in Lagos? Like, um, how was that like? Every typical oh, Lagosian. Every exactly <laughs> like right. If in our face me, I face you house. We all wow, carry interesting. Army bag. That's my roots too. Yes, we all carried our US Army bag to school with all the 14 textbooks, mm -hmm. all the 14 notebooks, very heavy bag. Um, thank God they didn't affect our spines then. We trekked in the we enjoyed trekking in the rain, going to school. And we just enjoy school. I love school. Um, so I grew up like every other typical person on the street. Um, but I was very mindful of two things. I was very, very mindful of education. I loved education. My mom comes back home every day, 6 p.m. And the first thing she tells me is drop your books, go and have your lunch. Because when I go back home, I will do all my homework. When I finish my homework, I'll pick up the next exercise and start solving them. 
and I would continue like that. I wouldn't even have my lunch. So when she comes in, she knew that was my habit. So she would like, drop that book, go and have your lunch. So I would eat lunch and then come back. And you know, then it is okay, so take off your uniform. Now go and do your home chores and things like that. Because I just loved books. That was just me. And at some point in time, um, when we left secondary school, of blessed memory now, uh, Paul Loffin at the time, he, he had a farmland in Lagos. He invited some of us to like, instead of loafing around, you know, all the in-between exams that we had, we should come and work on his farmlands. So he gave us portions of land to till. I planted all kinds of vegetables. We got introduced to the pig farm where we learned how to take care of pigs and we were paid for that service. Mm -hmm. So we started learning dignity of labor there. So if you saw us then, you wouldn't believe it's the same us speaking Queen's English today. Wow. We were typical <laughs> farm boys. <laughs> That's great. That's really, really great. And then at some point, uh, we had middle women who would come and buy those vegetables from us and then resell. But I found out that they were selling that almost 10 times more what they were buying from us. So I chose to sell myself. And that led me sometimes to hawk the vegetables or to place them in front of our house and while people are passing by. Because the way I place them is a little more than what you will find in the conventional market. So people want to buy more from me and also seeing that it's fresh from the farm. So I made a lot of money from there. And with the money I made, I would go to Osho Diden, you know, very rough place, buy all the textbooks. There was one pair of shoes I bought then. I bought it for 400 naira. I wore that shoe for almost four or five years. Even when it was tight, I was happy bending my toes inside it because I rocked that shoe. It was, <laughs> it was my best shoe at the point in time. And, you know, so it was just that life, you know, we were exposed to a number of other things, the vices, but somehow I think the church mediated at that point in time, because for us, the question Brother Stephen used to tell us then, our pastor in the children's church, is, you know, will Jesus be happy with you if you do this thing? So there were the girls. I mean, the question I tell myself is, so how would Jesus feel, you know, if I got involved in this? There was the stealing, the, those things just never appealed to me. And it was simply because I internalized everything I was taught in church. I believed it with the whole of my heart. So it kind of moderated my life. Even when we watch Chinese films back in the day, and then we all come out and we are like, hey, yeah. The moment I do hair, yeah, my heart condemns me and I'm like, oh God, so I can't even fight Chinese, true. <laughs> <laughs> you know? wow. it, it felt like torture, but somehow the word of God we were consistently exposed to. For me, it just curtailed everything I could. I mean, I, I was also a victim of sexual abuse. We had an aunt who wore nothing but her panties. She was completely naked apart from her panties. Gave me cream to be rubbing her back. You know, she slept beside me sometimes, you know, making passes. It just never clicked in my head. It was not until I got married and I'm like, oh, was she actually inviting me to come and sleep with her? Ah, it didn't click in my head. And, and I told myself, I said, how will it click in your head on multiple lines? <laughs> wow. We weren't exposed to all those kinds of things. So it was never appealing to Ross, you know, and some of those things. But, you know, I thank God overall. I mean, we are what we are by the grace of God and we are still trusting God. Thank God. Thank you so much for sharing all those. <laughs> like, really, thank you so much, sir. Um, so I want to touch also on um, your wife when you were going to marry, get married. How did you know she was the one? Like, can you give us tips? Like, how did you know that this is the woman for me or this is the will of God for me? She I still asked God yesterday, are you sure she's the will for me? <laughs> <laughs> That's interesting. <laughs> interesting one, yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> You, you know, the truth is, I'm a very transparent person. I'm not just with God, with every person I meet. And I tell God everything. There were sisters I liked in the fellowship. And there were people I was very close to. 
I never thought about marriage because I felt zoology. Which sister will ever want to marry a zoologist? Let me better go and look for work first because all these sisters, they don't want to stick their future with a man that they don't know whether has a future. So I never even bothered about praying to know God's will or anything. When they tell me back on campus, I'm, I mean, I beg, I beg, maybe you, you are a doctor, you, you are a chemical engineer. It's easy for you to marry now. Who won't marry you? You know, I, I had those feelings. It was during my NYC, I... One of my, I think even before NYC, my AGC then, Brother Usman, my GC, Brother Ali Masuya, um, Pastor Sunday Omonijo, who was our prayer coordinator at the time, they had met me at different times and more or less like giving words of prophecies that, look, you're going to be a very great man. Please settle this marital area of your life. And I was like, yeah, I, I pray too, and I read the Bible, and he gives me assurance that I'm going to be a great man. <laughs> so, so, but this marriage thing that you guys are just trying to pressurize me, I don't understand. <laughs> so each time I try to pray about marriage, I, I had goose pimples because women had never been my thing. I, I just didn't think about it. Though I felt loved, I felt appreciated. I was up and doing serving God. And I knew there were a number of people who felt excited by my presence. But it didn't just cross my mind that, okay, any of these things could translate into people having feelings for me until people then started approaching me. Wow. And yes, uh, yes, I had a couple of people who actually felt they were led to me and told someone who told me and i can remember the first time i was in lecture hall and i kept sighing at a point in time my lecturer had to pause and he looked back and he said victor i hope all is well i, I said yes all is well he said it's, everybody said yes you'll be signing things and i'm like really i'm sorry all is well because really i was like how can a sister think of me as if who am i <laughs> Can you imagine? <laughs> <laughs> well, I got to NYC, I knelt down and I prayed, and my wife's name popped up on my mind. Apart from then, she was my student during her jam classes. Um, I taught her in class, and in fact, I disciplined her a lot then. So the thought of her being my wife never occurred to me. And when that came up, there was somebody else I liked, I loved, appreciated. And when I prayed about it, he said, no. So when her name popped up, I'm like, okay, but God, that means that's going to be a long wait because she's just starting medicine part one. How long am I going to wait for before I get married? <laughs> and number two, how do I tell my former students that I wanted to marry her? Um, so I told some of my leaders here in Lagos and they just told me, you know, just trust God, you know, God knows how to work things out. So I was visiting Ife some time. And then she sent me a message. You say, oh, she would like to see me before I left. And she put the message like, I'm sure you know it's an anathema for you to leave without seeing me. <laughs> so I'm like, oh, really? And you know, the way they throw spiritual lingos around on campus mm -hmm. back in the day. And it wasn't just her, a number of other brothers and sisters just mm -hmm. wanted to talk to me, you know, mm -hmm. at that point in time. So I was with her and we were having a conversation. And it got to a question, she said, oh, Maybe when Mrs. Adebayo comes on board, she will feel free to ask that question directly to Mrs. Adebayo. So I told her, do you even know if you are the Mrs. Adebayo? <laughs> <laughs> wow. And that was how she busted into laughter and said, you can't be serious, you can't be serious. And she was like, are you serious? So at that point in time, it was like, oh my God, what have I done? <laughs> do I tell her I'm not serious and lie? Because <laughs> I had felt led to her and do I tell her I'm serious and then I incur the rot of marriage committee per se. Mm. I'd rather offend the marriage committee than offend God. Come on. Mm. And you know, I told her yes and I apologized. I told her, look, I know this is what the church process is like, but this is the prayers. And I told her clearly, you know, I loved somebody else. I liked her, you know, I loved her and I felt she was going to be the one. I prayed it was not her you know though she also felt led to me but well somehow i mean based on the conviction i had it was don't go in that particular direction go in this other direction but it was okay for her to say no to me because 
I value the relationship we had as mentor to mentee mm-hmm. versus, you know, compose really has to be husband and wife. Mm-hmm. So please, if it's a no, I mean, I could even be making mistake for whatever. And she was like, you know, stop trying to, you know, play it all down. But she's had me. And, you know, if she, when and if she has an answer, she would let me know. And that was it. So I came home, I told my pastor. He said, just go and report yourself to marriage committee. And I told marriage committee. And they were all like, well, it happens. I mean, you can post people, we understand how it goes. But then, you know, some things happened. The marriage committee, if they didn't like it, um, it led to a long brawl, you know. Um, eventually, and I think I heard to, about that one. That yeah, one. Pastor Kumi had to intervene and, yeah. you know, he called everybody. Yeah. Because the marriage committee was going to cancel the wedding and they told me it can't hold. We need to postpone it. You're going to discipline me. And I'm like, why are you all suddenly turning around? Because the marriage committee in Ife is threatening to report you to the GS in Lagos. So you all are afraid for your positions. Hmm. And I will be the sacrificial lamb so that you could retain your position. You've been very cooperative all along. So why this suddenly sudden turn around? Because Ife people were not happy that, you know, I told her, before i had come to them and i said this is the circumstance so what was it and you know the pastor in effect told me off badly he spoke to me in a very brash manner even on the pulpit people around were hearing i felt embarrassed but my district pastor had told me in lagos he said look let me tell you something when you go and meet this man he will abuse and insult your sensibilities never speak one word I know us in the church. It is one of the wrong nuances in our church. And I know the average deeper life pastor. He will not spare you. He will use the scriptures to tear you down to do everything. And just as he told me, so it happened. And when I came back, I told him everything. He said, didn't I tell you? He said, did you reply him? I said, no. He said, brilliant of you. So now when you get to the GS, the GS will say, is your elder is superior whatever he has said you should not have replied him and so the gs would then focus on you so that you did not reply him that was great so when the mc was pushing to say okay they will have to still postpone this wedding and i told them no it's not going to happen they said the only person that can give approval is the gs and i said well let's go to the gs everybody said ah I said, yes, it's my father, so why not? So we went to the GS and they told the GS everything and the GS said, and you disciplined him because of that? He said, yes. He said, please restate him immediately. Let the young man go and do his wedding and let nobody disturb him. Case dismissed. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> Thank you so much for being this woman with this because, I mean, sometimes we revere... Um, some people in the church to the point that you know because i know it was a sincere mistake and most people that even heard about it may not know that it was it look at the way you said it now from that context it was something that came out and then how do i answer something you? i plan to go and do if i'm all. going to lie oh. if i'm going to yes <laughs> i'd rather offend man than offend god and i think this is really a good one for us to learn from thank god that gs really took it that way thank you so much we are getting better and it's it's, for me i believe god uses every situation i pass through in life to Mm. be able to pass it and he's told me that since i was in the university and it's one, one thing i cherish is my personal relationship with god i've had very rough times i've had troublous times but he tells me look you're going to speak someday and you talk about this and I can remember relating this story during the YPF session and people were wondering why I was still in the church mm. haven't gone through some of those things and I said the first passage of the scriptures that came to my mind was taking no offense in all things that the ministry you know blamed mm. these people were acting on the basis of the knowledge they had at the time today I am friends with all of these pastors can you imagine that <laughs> so <laughs> So what shall separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus? Don't be, it hurt me then. It really hurt me. My wife cried then. She told me the pastor called her, you know, very unprintable names, you know, referred to her like a prostitute, you know. It was really, really tough. But I just said, you know what, let's just calm down. Let's not further escalate this, you know. Let's just let it be and all of that. Um, sometimes how I navigated that period, I can't tell. 
but at least i'm able to relate that story to be able to encourage other people don't let the devil set up his up set us up against each other somebody may i mean the bible said and then the devil entered peter peter was born again but you know he started rebooking jesus you won't go to the cross you won't do this you won't do that but there was some other strange spirit behind it temporarily the devil could manipulate some of us to do certain things the grand aim and scheme of things is to make us derail from the faith don't give in to allowing him do that for us using us against each other we may have that misunderstanding reach out to people who can encourage you and then as time goes we we all know in parts some people i have had stories of some other people whom their pastors came back to them years later on to apologize to them on the position they took at certain instances in their lives so i mean we are humans only god is perfect so we learn from it yes it's painful yes it hurts uh, i mean i'm a victim of it too and i mean i've just summarized it all if i told you all the yeah. things that happened then eh, i'm sure somebody will pick up a gun on my behalf but you know what we are where we are today by god's yeah. grace going through all of that it really takes courage to stay back and it's beautiful because you can share your story today and you can show yeah. us a more excellent path to take. Thank you so much. Lastly, you are an HR manager. Can you give us a few tips when it comes to interviewing people? What are you looking for? Tell me about yourself. How do, the, how do you respond? You see, in modern day human resources, human resources has also evolved from the days of personnel management uh, to operational HR, transactional HR, and then we're doing more strategic, excuse me, strategic human resources today. We would rather focus on behavior than skills. And behaviors can't be taught per se, it's tough. Skills can easily be taught. So I want to hire someone with the right attitude. Now, interviews are not the best way, but they are the best known way of telling people who will do well on your job. And so we asked today what we, the kind of questions we asked today is what is known as behavioral interviews where we are measuring your behavioral competencies so when i ask a question about can i meet you i just want you to tell me a little about yourself i may be assessing your communication skills how well you can articulate yourself how you can gather your thoughts together how you can sequence things in proper order my name is you know this is my gra i graduated with this course you know this has been my experience over the years this is some of the things that i have done a little about me from the family side i'm married i've got a child i've got two children you know i stay in this part of town you know and this is something i want to do but if there are areas you want me to hone in on I'll be happy to share more. You know, you just summarize everything. First, your academic qualification, professional qualification, a brief summary of your years of experience, and maybe some of the things you have achieved. You then go back to see on the personal side, this is me, my family, a little about my hobbies. And you know, if there are any areas of me you would like to know more, I can share more. So all we just want to know is the behaviors you demonstrate during various circumstances in life. And then we can then tell on the job, you will also demonstrate such behaviors, such mindset. So I can remember asking a question to a candidate. Tell me about a time when you solved a difficult problem before. What was the problem? Why was it difficult? And how did you solve it if you were able to solve it? But if you were not able to solve it, you know, what lessons did you learn? I didn't ask all the questions in quick succession because I wanted answers before I did the follow-up questions. But for the sake of our conversation, I had to state it all. And she looked up, looked down, looked up, looked me straight in the eye and said, do you mean spiritual? <laughs> and I'm like, <laughs> and I'm like, what? I have to look around me. Do I have the sign of the cross anywhere in this office? <laughs> you know? Wow. Uh, but, you know, other candidates shared, you know, challenges in their lives, at home, in their first place of work, in school, you know, what those problems were, how they went out of their way to gather information regarding how to solve that problem, how they process that information, how they also leverage your mentors and, you know, coaches, and then they arrived at their own decision. And then, though it was successful, but they also still learned that they could have even made it a better success 
by doing ABC. So those were the things we're looking out for. It's not so much as to the storyline, but as to those behavioral competencies and how they were demonstrated in the course of doing those things. So it may be a work-related problem you want to share, for instance. Oh, I just took on a new job and I was the finance manager and they were going to have the AGM meeting in about two weeks and I was asked to be able to get the books of account ready. I mean, here I am just two weeks on the job. I mean, I have two weeks, I'm one day on the job. I don't even know where the information is. And then these were some of the things I had to do. So how did you solve that problem? How did you reach out to some of your colleagues to get the previous year's books of account, the various details of books of account, the various components, who you were able to reach out to, how you were able to put them together quickly, get them reviewed by some of your superiors. And it is those doings that they want to see and know. In the course of you explaining it, you would also mention some of your competencies and skills, technical competencies and skills, because of course, in the preparation of the book of accounts, there are some things you must know. So they can pick those things from there. But typically, what they are looking for are those behavioral sides to things. And that made you know, significant difference in everything. Wow, that's interesting. And you could, one good thing that I've learned from this is also you could tell stories of things that happen outside your job, not necessarily on the job. Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. absolutely. Things that happened in the past, basically, and then you just relate them as storylines. These Hmm. things happened and this is what I was able to do in those situations. Pretty much that. Thank you so much, sir, for sharing that. So, do you have final words, like advice for Christian professionals? Like, what would you say as a mentor <laughs> that you are? Yeah. Um, there are two things I share with my mentees. Mm-hmm. One of them is, if you choose not to go through life with your head, you will still live through life with your body. <laughs> Whether you're a Christian or not, If you choose not to go through life with your head, you will live through life with your body. Invest in here, because that's where the real value is. And the second thing I say is, beware of the time when sin becomes inconsequentially cheap. I can tell you for free at at this level. I mean, it's, it's the woman I don't want that I can choose to say I don't want. If I make up my mind today to say, you know what, I think I want to, you know, go mess myself up with somebody. Hmm. I, I have one, two, three, four, five, 10, 20, 30 people I could call who would immediately tell me they will book the place themselves. I should just come over. You know, and you look at it, what are you going to spend for them? I mean, you practice all the safe, whatever. And, and the devil throws all of these things at us. I mean, I've had occasions in the past where, you know, the temptation was like Joseph and one had to flee one had to escape and over time it begins to like see you miss that opportunity the devil makes it look like an opportunity he will never tell you it's a temptation to sin so beware of when everything becomes inconsequentially cheap because the devil will use it against us and like the bible says a man's gift makes room for him beware i say a man's gift is also the major source of his temptation. Wow. So Christian professionals, yes, you know, we, we we just need to understand that you are a representative of Christ in the corporate world. There are so many sharp practices that they do there, but you just want to live and reflect Christ in all you do. It's not going to be easy. It's not going to be easy. I must be frank with you. I have my moments. But what we also set up is accountability partners. I have some other Christian brethren too, who I talk to. If I'm feeling low, if I'm feeling down, I can pick up the phone and call them and be very vulnerable to them. And they're not going to condemn me (laughs) and tell me, you see, you went into a Bible study. That is why this is happening to you. They will simply pray along. Some of them were like, let's hang out in so, so, so place. You know, it just helps you to be able to get over all of those things because we are running that race to heaven. It's not easy. Ah, when I get to heaven, I will sit down with Jesus and say, Ah, oh God, yes, he, 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 my eyes see wow. me. Wow. <laughs> That's incredible. Thank you so much for sharing. Those are really Thank great you. tips. I really appreciate you, sir. Thank you very, very much oh, for having me. Yeah. <laughs> to wrap up, what would you say to your younger self? Are there things that you would do better when you were younger? Is there anything? 
Honestly, I was so much of a church boy growing up. <laughs> so obedient to the core growing up. Um, the only thing I would have said to my younger self is um, to have been a bit more audacious in terms of exploring the opportunities available in the corporate world than just being also conservative and expecting us to do everything for me. Um, Seamless HR, you should know him, Okeleji Emmanuel. Yeah. I mean, he's a medical doctor. He, he runs a technology company today. He started on campus. I was not exposed to any of those things at all. So if I could speak to my younger self, I would say right from back in the day, you should have been reaching out to, you know, seasoned professionals, like some of the things you're doing now. I mean, we should do more of it and share with people in secondary schools, not even wait until they get to the university. So they start reaching out. It will give them more clarity on what they would have done, you know, graduating from school. And they would have even been set in their trajectory for life in terms of the corporate world before they get there. And virtually in every sphere of life too. I, I couldn't look ladies in the eyes. I was that shy. Though today, <laughs> my shyness, you know, but some of those things I could have been able to overcome and uh, not to make me do anything inappropriate, but to have helped me understand how to build better working relationship um, with other people. Because I, I had this way of always wanting to hide in my cocoon and not be exposed to everybody. <laughs> yeah, I can imagine. That is really great. Thanks for sharing. There we have it. I really appreciate you. Thank you so much for coming a lot. to our community. We really appreciate it.